Good morning, everybody. How are we today? Good. Well, hello to everyone online. I hope you're doing well at home or wherever you are this morning. And hi to everyone in Kendall. Hope it's beautiful up there on the mountain. We are all ready, whether you're here in the house, whether you're at home or up in Kendall, we're all ready to worship today, that's for sure. So let's stand up together. Let's spend some time worshiping our God because he is great and mighty and he is worthy of our praise. So let's put our hands together. Let's celebrate our God this morning. Here we go. Oh, Lord, my God.
Revelation 4 says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being.
Jesus, we, as we sing this song and we remember that you do deserve all the glory, as we're in this place for a lot of purposes today, to give you glory, to worship you, and to learn more about who you are, I pray that we become deeper in our understanding of the glory that you deserve, that we won't just be in this place to become more knowledgeable in the word of God or become wiser, but to uh, go into a deeper relationship with you. For all things are from you, all things are for you, and that includes our body, soul, mind, spirit, everything. It's all for you. So become greater as we become less. And we give you all that you deserve. You are worthy of it all. We thank you for that, Jesus. Amen. Oh, it's good to sing that kind of stuff to, to Jesus, isn't it? Just remembering that he is worth it. And we were worth it. And that's why we get to celebrate um, salvation today. Whether you're here or online, we just so we thank you for joining us as we, as we remember that this morning. So go ahead and say hi to your neighbor, and then you can take a seat. Well, happy Mother's Day. Hopefully all of you moms have heard that already. If not, this is your first time, and then that's awkward. Um, <laughs> but it is Mother's Day, and you know, that's not just for us moms. It's for any woman in here who is considered a mentor, or maybe you are an amazing auntie or the best grandma, or you know, just someone who has had the opportunity to pour into somebody whether it's um, family or friend. And so today we've asked people over the last few weeks to send in um, some pictures of their moms, their grandparents, or just that mother figure that you have in your life. And so we would like to, as a worship team, which if you didn't notice, is three sets of mother-daughter groups. So it's been fun to get to, to sing with our family this morning. We've been having a good time. But we have prepared a, a nice little song for you. So just pray that this is a blessing over you today and as you watch some amazing pictures of moms.
Thank you, ladies. That was beautiful. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. And guys in the back row, that was good. So let's give them another round of applause. Thank them for coming and being with us here today. So good. And happy Mother's Day from me to all of you in the room, but also online. My mama has been gone for about nine years now, and I still think about her a lot. And so my heart goes out to anybody that's lost their mother, but also I'm just so grateful for the many, many people that have invested in all of our lives over the years this way. So thank you for that, moms. So what would Mother's Day be like without a child dedication, right? And so we have Tiffany and Dylan Honkoop. They're going to come this morning. We're going to dedicate Olivia. So would you welcome them as they come? Come on up, you guys. So good. So what we do here at North County is that uh, families that would like to come and they dedicate their children. And what they're really saying, what you guys are really saying, is we're going to do our best to raise our kiddos in the love of Jesus. Right? It's that simple. That hopefully everything you do, whether it's... Hi. Hi, Olivia. Whether it's discipline or whether it's fun or, or whatever the case, teaching them how to work, whatever the case, you're doing it in the spirit of Christ, right? That's the hope. And so that's what we're going to pray over you guys today. And you have a legacy of family that's here today. So welcome, family. Good to see you today. And then we're going to pray over Olivia as well. So, Olivia, your name means peace, right? It means peace, like the olive tree, peace. And your middle name, Jane, is actually in your family. Several family members carry that name, right? And your dad, when he was getting ready to pass away, said Jane is the next baby's name. So your middle name is Jane. And Jane comes from John, which means God is gracious. God is gracious. So Olivia, we're going to pray over you and we're going to proclaim your name over you, the peace of God in your life and the graciousness of God in your life. Okay? So family, what we like to do is we like to extend our hand. And in the Bible, that simply means you're blessing them. It's not weird. It's just what the Bible teaches. And so I'm going to come behind you guys and pray for you, okay? All right. Let's bless this family today. God, first, I want to thank you so much for Dylan and Tiffany. Thank you for their heart for you, Christ, and and their lives that are committed to living out and walking out their faith. And they do that in the community, and I thank you that they do that with their children. I thank you for the legacy that they come from. Thank you for um, fathers and mothers, grandparents that have been prayer warriors, that have been active in their life over the years in just living the love of Christ for them. And now they get to do that for their children. So we thank you for that legacy of just living the love of Jesus for our kids and, and bless them and help them do that to the best of their ability. Help them to do that through the power of your Holy Spirit who lives in them. And God, today we just thank you for little Olivia. Thank you for her, Lord. Thank you for the gifts and the abilities that you've placed in her. Thank you for her name that means peace. And I just pray, Lord, that through her life she'd experience the peace with you that comes from knowing Jesus, that that you came to be that peace. And I just pray that she'll learn that at a very, very young age and will give her heart to Jesus. And Lord, thank you for her middle name, which means God is gracious. And we just pray God's grace over your life, Olivia. And we pray that you would be a woman of grace in your community, um, in those places that you get to be with friends and with family, that you would be a woman of grace. We just speak that over you. So bless this family, Lord. Give them all that they need. May your best happen in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. I got to get your blanket. Hold on a second. All right, you guys get a little quilt, Olivia. You get to wrap yourself in this. This has been prayed over. So as you wrap yourself in it, you're wrapping yourself in the prayers of people, okay? So God bless you guys. Thanks for letting us do that today. Yep, let's thank them for coming on up. There you are. They are all so cute. I remember when my kids were like, they've let me dress them. Anyway, happy Mother's Day to all of you, whether your kids are little or old, whether they're near or far, or whether or not you have a mother still with you or not. Being a mom and having a mom can be difficult, but it's worth it. And so I just want to say happy Mother's Day to each and every one of you. Uh, For you men folk, um, I have a gift for you today. 
It is a tip on what to get your woman that you forgot to purchase anything for. It is coming up soon in the announcements, so pay attention, grab your phones, get ready. You won't have to run to Safeway or Food Pavilion when we're done with church. All right. Welcome. I haven't said it yet, but my name is Sarah, and I am your small group director. I am pleased to be here with you guys today. (laughs) I brought my fan club. (laughs) No. I am all of your guys' fans, and if I am not yet, it's because we don't know each other yet. So I would love to get to know you. Go ahead and take out your phone, scan the QR code in front of you if you're in the building, if you're online. Go ahead and click the link they're going to drop in the comments. Let us know you're here. Let us know a little bit about you, how we can pray for you, or help you feel connected here in a church. It's a big place, but we don't want you to feel missed. We want you to feel loved. That's what us mothers do. So go ahead and connect with us this week. We would love to connect with you. All right, gentlemen, this Friday night, if you have not yet purchased something for your wife, or if you have, and you want to earn the bonus points, you are going to go to nccdk.com slash events, and you are going to purchase a ticket to Collide's Reckless Love Conference this week. It's taking place here. Women from all over the county are all coming here. We plan to pack the house. And we're going to talk about the reckless love of God and how we as women can be reckless lovers of our children and anyone else in our life. So you want your wife to come to this thing. Don't neglect it. Don't put it off. It's happening this week. So go ahead and sign up. Women, you deserve to come. So if your husband is not technologically advanced enough to sign you up, you do it for yourself, okay? You come. It's going to be great fun. I'll be here and I hope to see you here as well. All right, moms, you know the power of a good story, right? Good story teaches a lesson. Good story lulls people to sleep in the evening. You are all storytellers, stories of your mother's stories and her mother's stories. And we take after Jesus in that aspect. He was a storyteller too. So we're about to dive into our sermon series, all on parables, little stories that Jesus told. Pull out your Bibles, and we're going to hear from a mother of our own, Brie, as she tells us of her favorite story that Jesus said. So let's get into it. Hi, everyone. I'm Brie Mayberry, and I'm on the children's ministry team. I've always loved the Good Samaritan parable because of the kindness it displays. Jesus calls us to love others, and one way we can love others is through kindness. Look around you every day and see what little things you can do to be kind. Maybe it's opening a door for someone or reaching an item on the top shelf at a grocery store or simply smiling at someone who passes by. One of my family's favorite things to do around Christmas is bring our neighbors Christmas goodies. My kids look forward to this day every year. Most of the time, our neighbors say they also look forward to this day every year. This small act of kindness brings so much joy to everyone. We never know what Jesus will use to work in others' lives. So church, let's go out this week and be kind to our neighbors. Oh, let's hear it for Bree. And I know Bree, I've known Bree for a long time. She is a good mama. She loves those kiddos really, really well. So Again, happy Mother's Day. I don't know what your traditions are, but for me, growing up here in Linden, in a big family, six kids over on the Benson Road, um, Mother's Day always included a big Sunday dinner. Anybody else? And back in the day, Dad didn't cook dinners. So I don't know, you know, Mother's Day, Mom had to cook. Um, yes, I hear over here, you, have that, you understand that pain, right? But my mom was a great cook, so Sunday, Mother's Day dinner was always a big deal. Uh, I grew up on Dutch food. Any other Dutch people in the room? So I grew up on Dutch food, um, which basically means roast beef and potatoes, ham and potatoes, baked chicken and potatoes, liver and ah, onions, liver and onions. I got you there, didn't I? But, you know, my mom was a great cook, but really it was about filling up the six hun- hungry kids and her husband are sitting around the table. It wasn't so much about taste. And I'm not complaining. Mom's food was good, but I don't remember ever experiencing, you know, savory things until like after high school. There were two spices in our household, salt and pepper, right? And that's what mom used. So there's five things that the tongue can taste. 
Um, some of you may know what these are already, so I'm not teaching you anything you don't know. But I grew up tasting only four. So there's five. I, did, I wasn't aware of the fifth one until I moved out of the house. But the four are, you got sweet, and that's a good Dutch thing, right? Cookies, pastries, those kinds of things. Uh, you have salty, salted herring is a big Dutch thing. Um, you have bitter, black coffee. Black coffee was a staple in our home. I was drinking coffee when I was like three, you know? <laughs> a lot of milk, a little bit of coffee. It was so good. And if there was any coffee left over at the end of the day, they just heated it up in a pan on the stove in the morning. Anybody else have that? Yeah. So that's just the way it was. Um, and then there was sour. Sour is one of the four tastes. And for that, we had rhubarb. Rhubarb everything. You can add rhubarb to any other kind of berry and make a great, great pie, right? So we had rhubarb. But then the fifth one, savory, actually has a name. It's umami. Not yo mommy, but you mommy, okay? And it means savory. And honestly, I don't think I ever tasted savory till I was out of my parents' home. But our, our soul, the soul that we carry within us, is like the tongue in that it tastes flavors. The soul tastes flavors. And these are the flavors of relationship. These are the flavors of friendship that we offer each other. And when you think about it, all friendships have these same five elements. The same elements you taste on your tongue are the same elements you taste in friendships or relationships. We've all known the sweet person, right? We've all known the salty person. We've known the bitter person. We've known the sour person. And hopefully all of us have a savory person in our life. And so those are kind of the five flavors that are intermingled in our life. We don't just have one of them. We have all of them. But friendship is the seasoning of the soul. And the parables I want to teach you today have everything to do with letting people taste God's goodness through us. His character, his values, and especially his mercy come from being around one another. And hopefully we're speaking those, we're, we're giving evidence of those of values of God into the people around us. And so our job is, number one in your notes today, our job is to give people a taste of Jesus' love. That is our job. Once you receive Christ, your job is to give people a taste of Jesus' love. In fact, he calls us ministers of reconciliation. That's our job. And Jesus said in Matthew 5, 13, this is your first parable today. We're going to have three. They're tied together. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 13, you are the salt of of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Or what good is salt if it stays in the container, right? Salt has to be poured out in order to, to be tasted. And so what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. So let's talk about this parable just for a minute this morning because I think this really should be what characterizes us as a church, as followers of Christ. You are the salt of the earth. You have your own unique flavor. There's nobody else with the same flavor that you have. And I see elbows like going right now, right? Like, yeah, you are unique. That's for sure. And so what I'm saying to you is that from the soul perspective, we each taste a little bit differently. We do. When we express ourselves in friendship or relationship, we taste a little bit differently. Some of us are like good comfort food, like my mom cooked. We're a little bland, but oh so filling, right? Um, some of us are, are sweet, and there's just like this overwhelming sweetness, and, and sometimes you can get even too much sweetness. I was at a wedding last night and had one of their wedding cupcakes, and by the end of the cupcake, I was like, you know the sweet trigger that you kind of have at the back of your throat, kind of moving into the head? Yeah, that thing went off last night. <laughs> it's like, okay, this is a little too sweet, and sometimes people can be a little too sweet, you know what I mean? Or someone may be a little bitter. They can be hard to be around, but maybe they're very honest and very truthful. Uh, someone can be sour. Anybody have, don't raise your hand, a sour person in your life. But each of us is tasty. That's the point. Each of us has something unique to offer in those blends of taste. We're all a little bit quirky. And don't you know you have your own definition of what normal is? Anybody else? Like you think you're normal, right? I have news for you. Everybody thinks that they are, are normal. But our job, and this is the point of this parable, our job is to let people be drawn to Christ through the tastiness, the salt of our life. And, and God says, don't leave that in the shaker. Shake it out. Don't, don't be a person that, that's got something to offer, which every, everybody does, and don't leave it in there, but rather shake it out upon the people around you. Let people taste of your life and let it draw them to Christ. 
And the Bible says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. And what I want to tell you this morning in response to this first parable is that God's goodness, his goodness, is best tasted through you. It says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. And God has left us on the planet, you know, with Christ in our lives and the Holy Spirit living in us, to be the ones that taste like him. And that draws people to him through the love and care that you have for the people that you encounter. You are the salt of the earth. You are the salt and the love of Christ. It's the little things that you do. It's the little words that you say. It's the small ways that you help somebody. The Bible says in Colossians 4, 5, and 6, Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. In, in other words, let them taste of the love of Christ through your life. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive. Another version says, seasoned with salt, so that you will have the right response for everybody, so that everybody can feel loved by Christ through you. Now, I want to camp on something a little bit this morning because I believe it is so important. It's important to me, and I know that it's important to the people that I love. And that is this thing called words of affirmation. Words of affirmation. Words are the savory salt of your soul. Words are the way that, that you express your love to somebody in your life. And we don't think about it much. Simply telling somebody what you love about them, simply doing that can just really ignite the sense of value that somebody has in their life. You know, we should think about it more. Oftentimes what I find is we wait until somebody passes away and then we go on the tribute page at Gillies or whatever funeral home is being used and we write these beautiful thoughts, memories about this person and my point is this, why not tell the person <laughs> while they're alive what you love about them and what they mean to you and what, what their value is in their life. This is something that's not only good for you to do, it's a great exercise, but this is something that is so beneficial to somebody who gets to hear those words. Again, what good is salt in the shaker if you never shake it out on the lives you know, of the people that you love? Now, you may be at family parties today, you may be at some Mother's Day things today, take the time to single out people in your life and tell them something good that you like about them. Even if you can only think of one good thing. Even if it's just that, Mom, thank you for giving birth to me. <laughs> Even if that's it. It's legit, right? Hopefully you have more. Um, if you're like me, I can't do that anymore because my mom has gone home. But I still think about her and I still am grateful in my heart for the woman that she was in my life. So letting somebody know what you like or what you value about them. Yesterday we did Mother's Day early because my wife has to work this afternoon and my daughter came over with her kids and I just held my daughter in my arms. I just said in her ear, I said, you're a great mom. Thank you for being such a great mom to your children. And it's the truth, absolute truth. She's a wonderful mother. But why keep that to myself, right? I can think it, but why not, why not say it? It's so important. Proverbs 18, 18, 21 says, death and, love, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Oftentimes, we quote that passage of Scripture, and we talk about the tongue being a fire, and we talk about the tongue in regards to gossip or, or in regards to saying harsh things or, or bad words to people, right? Well, what about the life? that's in the tongue? What about the opposite of all those bad things we can do with the tongue? What about the, the things that can bring life to people and can bring value and affirmation to their lives? So use your words of affirmation. Please don't let them stay in the salt shaker. Go to somebody that you love and say what you really think about them, the good things. And say what you really think about them, the good things, what they matter, mean and matter to you. Now, Jesus didn't just talk about words or salt, but he also talked about what you do. So not only what we say, uh, draws people to Christ, but what we do also draws people to Christ. Uh, he said, after he said, hey, I'm leaving, you're the light of the world, right? That's what he said, verse, or, or number two in your notes today, our job is to shine a light that draws people to Christ. Shine a light that draws people to Christ. Not just speak good words like salt in a shaker, but shine a light that draws people to Christ. Matthew 5, 14 and 16, this is parable number two. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everybody in the house. In the same way, and here it is, how do you do this? In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, 
so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. You know, when Jesus came, he said, I am the light of the world, right? But then when he got ready to leave, he said, you are the light of the world. And we are the ones that share and shed the light of Christ in the world around us. And how does Jesus say that we are to do that? He says you should do it with your good deeds, doing good things. You know, we understand that good deeds don't save us. But once we are saved, we experience the grace of Jesus and his amazing good deed in our life by forgiving us and saving us. Once we experience that, then it's our job to share good deeds so that the rest of the world can see the light of Christ shining through us. Jesus is the light of the world, and he's given us the task to be his light. And we do that through doing good things in his name. Good deeds. What is a good deed? I'll give you my definition today, okay? I think a good deed is anything that you do that costs you something, time, talent, treasure, in order to bless somebody else. In other words, you're not going to get anything from it. You're simply doing it so that they can be blessed, so that they can experience something good. Now, if you can't come up with your own good deeds, if you can't think of anything good to do, we're here to help you. We have lots of good deeds for you to do. That's what the church is here for, right? We gather together, not just on Sunday mornings, but all through the week. And we've got ways that you can give, ways that you can do. So here's, here's a couple examples, a good deed. What is holding babies on a Sunday morning? It's a good deed. Pure joy, thank you. What is greeting at the door on a Sunday morning? Good deed, right? What is making coffee for church? That's a really good deed. I'm telling you, we have happy campers in church because of the coffee makers. What is helping out at kids' camp? It's a good deed. I could go on and on and on. We've got, we got the tech team that shows up on Sunday mornings, and nobody ever sees them. If you turn around, if you turn around and look up there, look at, look at, there they are waving at you. They come at 7. They get no recognition. We know when they're not doing their job. Because of the screens, and by the way, that's still broken. We're fixing it. We're fixing it. It's coming in the mail. You know, you've heard that before. But, but listen, we have plenty of good deeds for you to do if you would like to do some here. But you can do them on your own, right? Everybody can do, can do good deeds. We're built for good deeds. We're at our best when we're doing good things for people. Things that uh, glorify God and that benefit somebody, okay? So what gets in the way? Why don't we do good deeds? And I think Jesus addressed this. He says, why have a light and then put a basket over it? So I've got my basket here. And, and as I read this scripture, I thought to myself, yeah, that makes sense. Why would, you, why would you shine a light and then put a basket over it so that nobody can see the light? So I found myself asking, what's the basket? And what does that mean? What is Jesus referring to? And I can't tell you for sure what he was referring to, but as I thought about the basket, and I thought about what is it that keeps me from doing something good for somebody else, here's what I thought. I thought I'd share it with you today. To me, the basket is fear and self-centeredness. Fear and self-centeredness. I'm just being honest, okay? Your pastor has fear, and your pastor is selfish. There you go. I got it out there. I need forgiveness just like you, right? So fear and self-centeredness. What's the fear about Well, for me, I think when it comes to doing something good for somebody else, sometimes I can fear rejection. I can fear that maybe they won't like it, or maybe it won't be good enough, or maybe it will fail in the end. And so there's that fear of, if if I do this thing, will it really be enjoyed? Will it really be received? And so i got to tell myself the same thing that I tell a wife in a marriage, or a husband in a marriage. I say... The gift that you give is good. Whatever it is that you're giving to your spouse or or to friend or whatever is good. It's the light. It's shining. That doesn't change dependent on what somebody does with your gift. You can still give the gift and it can still be good. And no matter what they do with it, it's still good. So whether it's rejected or whether it's not good enough, doesn't matter. Your gift, your gift is still good. Think about Jesus and the gift that he gave, right? And how many people have rejected his gift? Does that make the gift bad? Does that make Jesus sorry that he gave it? Absolutely not. He still gives the gift. And many, many, many people give, receive the gift. And so there, then there's this thing of self-centeredness. We, I do. I choose comfort over doing something good for somebody else. You know, maybe I don't want to leave the comfort of my home. Or maybe I'm all peopled out and I don't want more people. Or, you know... The list goes on and on and on, right? My own comfort. 
And we can easily choose our own comfort over somebody's well-being. And that, my friends, for me, can be a basket in my life. And, and that basket can go right over top, this beautiful light that God wants to shine through me of doing good deeds for others. And I just block the light because of fear or because of, you know, the idea of comfort, self-centeredness. So Jesus had a parable for this. And this is the last parable of the day today, okay? You can find it in your Bible, in Luke 10. Verses 25 through, 30, through 29. Here's the parable Jesus told about this. One day, an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? I love how Jesus turned the question back on the guy, right? You answered the question. And the man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength and all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself right jesus said do this and you will live the man wanted to justify his actions so he asked jesus well who is my neighbor and i think the idea is that the man was hoping to kind of hoping to kind of narrow the field you know <laughs> maybe jesus you could disqualify some of the people i don't have to love as a neighbor, so I can just focus on this one band of people, right, in my life. And so he asked Jesus, if that was his justification for this, Jesus, who is my neighbor? And this question and the story that Jesus told in response to this question blew up this lawyer's life, just blew it up, right? And really blew up all the Jews' thoughts about what it meant to be a neighbor. And Jesus replied with this story. Here's the parable. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. The temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. Then... A despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. And going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, Take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. <laughs> now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandits? Jesus asked. And, and here you see this man couldn't even bear to say the name Samaritan. Like he couldn't bring himself to say the name Samaritan. So he replied simply, the one who showed him mercy. And then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. And number three in your notes today is, our job is to love people better than the world loves them. Now, you might remember if you were in church the morning that it happened, we had a woman in our church named Mary. And hi, Mary, if you're watching today. And she started out streaming our services from her home. She lived in Linden, didn't know where the church was physically, so she's streaming our services for several months. And the reason she streamed our services was because as a child, she was raised in a religious system where she experienced a lot of hurt and a lot of pain in her life through church. And so she began to stream our services to see if it was safe, to see if this was a good place, to see if, if there was hurtful things happening here, hurtful things being said, manipulation, those kinds of things, or, or whether we were a safe place to be. So for months, for months, she watched our services online and, and didn't dare to step foot through the door. Then one Sunday morning, she got up and she thought, I really want to go. I, I want to go to church. I want to figure out. I want to see what it's like. And so she watched the 9 o'clock service to make sure it was safe. <laughs> Can you believe this? Right? There's a lot of pain wrapped up in this story. She watches church to make sure it's safe. She didn't hear anything hurtful. And so she finally came to the 11. And she walks in. And she walks into a room filled with people that she's never experienced this in her whole life. The church system she went to didn't worship like you all worship. So she walks in and she's met with this expression of worship from people that, that love Jesus. 
And while she was in the crowd worshiping, God met her powerfully. And in that moment of worship, without anybody prompting her, without me saying, you know, you should accept Christ, anything being said, she was confronted with the love of God, and she gave her heart to Christ in that moment, in the middle of worship. And didn't, you know, nobody helped her. It was just one of those things. She, she felt the love of God, and she responded, right? And she didn't even know everything about what she had done. So she emails me on Monday morning. She says, Pastor Kurt, this is what happened. I said, well, why don't you come on in? I'd love to, to talk with you, and your next step would be to get baptized. So she came in. She talked with me, and then I think it was a couple of weeks later, we baptized her on a Sunday morning and told just a little tiny bit of her story. And so what I found out from Mary this week is that she's been in Kenya for the last couple of weeks. And she's a midwife, licensed midwife in our county. And she's been in Kenya, and she has been delivering babies in the slums of Nairobi uh, with women who can't afford any kind of medical attention. They're poor as poor. And so she has gone to the depths of despair. She felt compelled to go and help in this birthing center. And they deliver as many as three babies a day. While they're there, she said, Pastor Kurt, you know, I maybe do one or two a week, but none of this three babies a day business. And she emailed me, and I wanted to read it to you because I felt it was so compelling for me that this is how this woman has responded to the love of God in her life and has wanted to be a part of giving mercy, giving mercy to somebody in her life. So here's the email she sent me this week. She said, My goodness, how life has changed since baptism. And God finding me shortly before that. I feel he has put me in a long time of separation. A time to learn to hear his voice. It has been a quiet solo time for sure. I currently am in Nairobi doing volunteer midwifery relief at a very busy birth center in the Kawangari slum. I arrived April 28th. I'll be home June 1st. One thing I've noticed here is that praying is a regular part of their fabric. They pray before staff meetings and during births. Mothers have asked me to pray over them when labor is hard or when the baby's not doing well. One little baby was having such a hard time. We worked to stabilize her breathing for an hour and a half. About an hour into it, I started softly singing to her. I speak the name of Jesus over you. In your hurting, in your sorrow, I will ask my God to move. And she says the words were so true for me and for her in that moment. I want you to show the picture again, guys, if you can, with the two arms together. This is a picture taken during delivery of of this woman holding her arm. And, And Mary told me in a different email that this woman had never seen. She said, I've never seen skin like yours. And she would just rub and rub and rub the skin as as Mary helped her make it through this process of childbirth. But isn't this a beautiful picture? beautiful picture of what mercy produces in a life. And I tell you that story just to say, for me, it's inspiring (laughs) to think about Mary leaving her life here, you know, time, talent, and treasure. She put her business on hold. You know, she put some pregnant moms on hold here, I suppose, had to find subs in midwifery to help the women that she would have helped, right? I mean, she sacrificed a lot to go to these slums and to be there for these women that desperately need help. But because of what she has to offer, these are her neighbors. Let me say that again. Because of what she has to offer, because of her skill and her talent, these are her neighbors. These are the ones that God has compelled her to go and to help. You know, in our parable that I just read to you, it's interesting that Jesus made the Jew a victim. I don't know if you've ever thought about that before. When you think about the story, I'm sure what the Jewish lawyer was looking for was for Jesus to make him the hero that would come along and then Jesus would tell him, you know, which neighbor he had to love or how to love a neighbor, right? Or who he didn't have to love is probably more likely. But what Jesus does instead is he makes the Jewish man the victim in the story. And really what he's saying to this lawyer is, You know, how would it feel to you? And would you want somebody to help you if you were in a a terrible condition, right? 
And you think about the priest, and I know we've heard this story, many of us have heard this story since childhood, and you think about the priest, oh, he wasn't loving, or oh, he didn't have any compassion. But that wasn't the problem. In fact, I would suggest that possibly the priest felt guilty about not stopping. I would. But here was the problem with the priest, and it was, it was religion. It was his duty. It was the temple rules. I don't know if you know this, but a priest could not get within seven feet of somebody who was dead. And so for him, he assumed that the man was dead. And so he wouldn't even cross the street. Now the the helper of the temple crossed the street, took a look, and then went on his way. But the priest was really held back by what he believed was his sense of duty. He didn't want to risk his position because this guy might be dead. He might be dead. He assumed the worst. And as I read this story again, it made me think, how much do we assume about others, about those that God puts in our path to help? And again, I'm preaching this to myself, folks. I'm not judging anybody. These are, these are the things that I, I deal with myself. But how much do we assume when someone is dying in their dysfunction or you know, in their addiction? Or how about mental health? How about somebody that struggles with mental health? What do we assume about a person? Or, or what about sin? What about sin? Or, or particularly the sin that we don't like. What do we assume about that person? And what is it that becomes our basket and keeps us from doing the good deed that Jesus would have us do for the life of somebody that desperately needs our help? Do we assume that they're dead? You know what I mean by that that they're dead, that they're beyond help, that they're beyond what we can offer, or will we do what we can? Where is the mercy, is my question. Mercy is such a, a valuable thing to God. God values mercy so much that he gave it to us, right? He didn't give us what we deserved. He had mercy. And I think the question comes up, too, when, when we're looking at people and thinking about whether or not to help them, is, is what are people going to think of us What are people going to think of me if I associate with this particular sin or this particular issue? If I become friends or I I try to help somebody that deals with a certain something, fill in the blank with, with, you know, the sin that you hate the most. And what are people going to assume about me? And that's exactly what the priest was going through, and that's what we go through. But I want to remind you today that Jesus always chose association over assumption. Always. Always. And that's why the religious leaders hated him, because he befriended the people that they did not like or approve of. And I would suggest to you that if that's Jesus' form of mercy, then that's what he would invite us to do as well, to get messy, to get involved with the lives of the people that are lying along the wayside. So then in our story, along comes the most despised person Jesus can think of. Like he puts the Jew in the victim position, right, his brother, in the victim position. And then he says, okay, now who should the hero be? (laughs) And he chooses the guy that all Jews would hate the most, the Samaritan. And why was that? Because the Samaritan was a half-breed. He was half Jew, half Gentile. The Jews hated the Samaritans, would have nothing to do with them, even more than the tax collectors. They hated the Samaritans. And this Samaritan stops everything he's doing and he, he comes, comes upon this Jew who hates him. And he kneels in the dirt and he dresses the wounds and he gets Jewish blood on his hands and on his clothes. And he puts him on his horse. He brings him to an inn and he opens a tab. Now, no Dutchman would ever do that. <laughs> I got to that part and I'm like, now nah, I'm out. Right? Right? So there's my my frailty I'm telling you about. Open a tab and leave it open. Are you kidding me? He'll probably order beer. You know what I'm saying? He'll probably spend it on alcohol. You ever had that conversation with yourself? I have. Opens a tab, and why did he do it? Why did he do it? Why did the Samaritan do this? It was mercy. It was mercy. You know, mercy carries with it just this beauty of God's heart. God is so merciful, and if there's anything that expresses the goodness of God that people can taste and see, it's mercy. 
Mercy is it. Now, I'm not suggesting you get involved with somebody's sin or, or do the things they're doing. No, Jesus didn't. He went, he hung out with them, and then he led them to better places. Didn't judge them. He came to seek and save them. And he did that because of mercy. And I'm suggesting that, that we can do that too, and, and that, in fact, it best represents Christ when people like us show mercy. Not judgment, but mercy. Mercy is more important than the rules. I understand we need rules. Don't, don't get me wrong. Mercy is more important. Jesus, Jesus broke the rules for mercy. Got to remember there was no good Samaritan law yet, so this guy wasn't even following the law. That's a joke. You get it? Okay. But he interrupted his own schedule, and he risked his own reputation for mercy. So I think when it comes to the salt and I think it comes to the basket, I think that mercy is the thing that best tastes like God. Mercy is the light of the world. Mercy is the salt that, that God wants us to be. And so I guess what I'm saying today is, is, is do something this week that's merciful. Give somebody something that they don't deserve. Something good <laughs> that they don't deserve. Right? <laughs> give somebody something good that they don't deserve. Give them a kind word or give them a good deed, an act of service. And maybe you think, yeah, they don't deserve that. I'll give it to them anyway. It's the love of Christ shining through you. You know, I don't know if you've thought about this, but Jesus was revealing himself in this story. In this story, if you look for the deeper meaning of this parable, Jesus was the good Samaritan in this story. I don't know if you thought about this. But just like Samaritans were half Jew, half Gentile, Jesus was fully God, fully man, right? Talk about defiled blood. You know, he was defiled with humanity, if you will. Um, Samaritans were rejected by the religious people, by the Jews. Jesus was rejected by the Jews because he didn't always keep the rules and he loved sinners. And they hated that about him. They rejected him about that. And then in Psalms, you find that Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted and bind up their wounds. He didn't come to cross the street and go on by. Jesus came to stop, to pause, to kneel down in the dirt of your life and to bind up your broken heart, your bleeding wounds where you've been injured by life or by sin. Jesus came for that. And that's what Jesus wants us to be for others. So I'm going to invite the band to come back. And I just want to remind you today as we close that Jesus left an open tab for your life. You thought about that? Just like the Samaritan, Jesus left an open tab, which means that we don't abuse it. We don't order a bunch of things we shouldn't order, <laughs> right? We don't sin as much as we can because grace abounds. No, but he left an open tab because he knows we're not perfect and he knows we're going to need payment for the things that we do, the sins that we commit, the failures that we have. He knows that, so he left an open tab. And this morning, as I was thinking about you, and I was thinking about how to close and how to pray, I just really felt compelled for mothers today, for mothers, okay? So we're going to close with prayer for you moms. And here's, what, here's the image I got when I was thinking about this. Because I talk to mothers, so I know what some of you go through. I thought to myself, okay, the ones that have things are well with their children, things are well with their own mothers, all that, they're fine. You don't have to pray for them, so I'm not going to. I want to pray for the moms today who feel like you're left bleeding and wounded along the wayside. And you just need Jesus to stop by and to bind up your wounds and to heal your broken heart. And I know there are some in the room today. And I know that there were times when my mom laid along the wayside and, and felt like she wasn't appreciated or felt like, you know, she wasn't valued and who really cared what she did. I, I know, I know. There are some moms that feel that way. Some of you are, are wounded along the, the wayside because your mom wasn't what you'd hoped she would be. 
And so today what I want to do and what I feel like the Holy Spirit has asked me to do is just to pray for you moms that feel like you need to be healed. Okay? Simple prayer that Jesus would stop by and bind your wounds and heal your heart. Okay, so let's pray. Let's pray. If that's you today, just receive that. God wants to take you a step further in your healing today. Father, thank you today for your amazing love for us. Thank you that you take the time to speak to us. You take the time to guide us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who brings about truth for us. And God, I want to thank you today specifically for all the moms that hear my voice today. And I just pray, oh God, that for those that feel um, not remembered or feel just undervalued a bit or, or who really appreciates me, God, I pray that those moms today would hear you say, thank you for giving the gift. Thank you for giving the gift to your children, to your husband, to your grandchildren. The gift is good. The gift is beautiful. The gift is worthy. Even if you feel like it hasn't been received or, or reciprocated to, thank you. I believe Jesus would say to you today, moms, thank you for giving such a beautiful gift. You gave the gift of life. You've given the gift of nurture. You love your children. And Jesus would say, I think I approve. I approve of you. So Jesus, thank you for that today. We receive it. And we're grateful that you are such a loving, good, good God in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to close our time today by singing a great song that kind of just wraps it together with some good praise. So stand with me, would you? And let's belt out one more great worship song from Jesus.
All right, since I don't want to leave the men out, let me give you God's blessing as you go today. Lord Jesus, thank you for every person in the room watching, everybody online. God, I just ask for your best to be poured out in and through us this week. May we be men and women of affirmation and men and women of good deeds and point people to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.